LTE arrays go extra quick. I just welcome you in Gaelic as show number six is dedicated to Ireland. Ireland, the Emerald Island, as named by Johnny Cash, to praise this wonderland surrounded by the North Atlantic, the Celtic Sea, and the Irish Sea, one has no shortage for reasons. The fragrant wildflowers of Ireland, the gorgeous ginger hair women, the music, the river dance, the castles, statues, and pedestrian bridges of Dublin. But the most important feature is the Irish people. Friendly, humorous, creative, chatty, with no dark agenda. Let's call them in their own terms, crack, which means fun, entertaining, cool. Today's menu is Irish with my modifications which I named a la Renault. Having that said, the appetizer is box tea, box tea a la Renault. The entry is oyster dumpling or oyster ravioli and the dessert is carrot tea scones. Box tea is a traditional dish in Ireland, almost a cliché, originated in northwestern Ireland in a county named Litrum, Today, box tea comes in a variety of recipes depending on the part of Ireland. There is Donegal box tea, Litram box tea, Cavan, Fermanagh, Longford, Mayo, etc. In fact, every house has its own version of box tea. For instance, the Donegal box tea is made of raw grated potatoes whereas the Litrim box tea is made of a mixture of boiled mashed potatoes and raw grated potatoes. Despite the varieties, depending on the method, there are three types of box tea, boiled, baked and pan box tea. I'm going to try something like Litrim box tea, but with my way twist. I must confess that with a few exceptions, such as dishes with meats, most of the other dishes I make in my shows are debuts. I experiment those first time in front of you. Box tea is one of them. I have never tried this one. Technically, it is like hash brownies only made on the pan. The main ingredients include potatoes, eggs, flour, oil, some cheese and seasoning. Here I have two types of potatoes. I will boil and mash the Idaho potatoes and will grate the raw red potatoes. Because I will modify box tea in my way, I'm gonna add different cheeses, bacon, parsley, green shallots, sesame seeds and even carmine some of the patties with red beet. Only some. Before making the potato mixture, let me roast this bacon in the oven. After, I will chop and add to the mixture. Now, in the bowl, go already pre-cooked and mashed Idaho potatoes, to which I will add the grated raw bread potatoes, which need to be squeezed in this cotton bag from IKEA. <laughs> extracting as much juice as possible. I suggest you don't rush discarding the red potato juice as it has immense healing effects and has rich iron content. I also use it in my sourdough starter which I raise here. I mix the mashed and grated potatoes. I add two egg yolks and one egg white as I don't want to be messy. I add cream, the amount of which is flexible depending on how well you extract the moisture from the raw potatoes. It is like making pancakes where you adjust the components for the right proportion. Next, I add all-purpose flour. And grated cheeses. Let's see. My son has already opened and used many of those, so I will use the leftovers as well. 
I have different cheeses here such as Amish Blue, Spanish Goat Cheese, Asiago, Apple Smoked Gouda and Smoked Gouda with Bacon, Parmigiano Reggiano, Bavarian Limburger and Münster. Inevitably, I can't use them all, as by that I will ruin the taste. I'm gonna grate only smoked Gouda, Asiago and Parmigiano, just to glue the mess properly. Further, I add the cooked and chopped bacon and mix the mess thoroughly. After, I add finely chopped parsley and green shallots, For the seasoning, I use freshly ground nutmeg, as it teems well with milk or cheeses, sesame seeds, black pepper and salt. I don't want to add anything else, as it would be too desperate. I separate a handful of mixture to carmine with grated red beets to have two different colors of boxy patties. I roast them in a covered pan on medium heat. Ready. Here you have it, box tea a la Renault. You can serve it with lox or caviar or scrambled eggs or black fig spread like this. I will only add some berries. and sliced clams. That's it. A good starter of the day. Try it. Conventionally, in each episode, I present a few pieces of my antique solid silver collection from British or German masters. For today's appetizer, I utilize this gorgeous pair of German creamer and sugar bowl made in 1819, before the decree of 1886 that would later mandate signing with Crescent and Crown. Both are marked with 835 purity per thousand and the town mark is Lion Lampert corresponding to Darmstadt. Let me magnify this for you. For the ground nutmeg, I use this Victorian mini jack on cabriolet legs. Made in 1901, as attested by the date letter small b, Made in Birmingham, see the matching anchor town mark. The makers are S, B and S. Further, I use this Victorian salt ball made in 1889 as proved by the date letter capital O. Made in London, see the Leo face for the town mark corresponding to London. There is also a duty mark with Queen Victoria's profile, then widely stamped until 1890. And the makers are Finlay and Taylor, who were licensed in London since 1883. Pot stickers. That's the technical name given to dumplings or ravioli, although the difference between the two is not only in the size or shape, but also in cooking methods. Unlike ravioli, dumplings can be steamed or fried, or both, fried, then steamed, then fried again. Don't let me even get more excited while I'm introducing the stuffing, which is His Majesty the Oyster. My son and I are avid consumers of seafood and always have a variety of seafood in the freezer. 
like baby squids or whelk meat, which we usually roast, grill or brine in wine. Yet today I focus on the oysters, the crown glory of the Irish cuisine. I do believe that dumplings with oysters is my original idea. I know, some of you are already raising bros while thinking of clam chowder, bouillabaisse or linguine van gold. No, no, I have checked and still cannot find an existing recipe of dumplings with raw oysters. Let's try it, making the results as Irish as possible. For the dough, I use one egg yolk, two cups of all-purpose flour, salt and warm water. I then stir and mix until the formation of a soft and elastic dough. I cover it with the plastic field and let it rest for 30 minutes to become even smoother. In the meantime, while I prepare the stuffing, let me remind you that raw and fresh oysters reflect the place where they grow. Pacific Northwestern oysters are milder and less challenging than Ireland's or New England's oysters. For example, a main oyster from the Atlantic coast is intense and briny, whereas the oyster of British Columbia is sweet. New Brunswick and Newfoundland produce mild oysters, but still these do not rival with Pacific oysters for sweetness. Oysters from Pacific, Northwest or Scandinavia or Japan or New Zealand are beginner friendly. The Irish oysters are not for beginners. Here I have 22 oysters. If the oysters are fresh, the shells are tightly closed. So you have to hold them with a towel on a flat surface, cup side down, and wiggle the oyster knife at the hinge tip of the shell, sliding it toward the adductor muscle to cut it open. Then releasing the oyster from the shells, meantime retaining as much liquid as you can. I'm going to filter this twice, one for separating the oysters and the liquid, and the second for filtering the liquid itself from possible sediments of mud or sand. Twice or thrice I will reserve the liquid for steaming. Now let's work on the oysters. I season with freshly ground nutmeg, black pepper, thyme, and garlic. I do not salt them, as you noticed, as seafood already comes with enough natural content of salt. I coat the oysters with melted butter to ensure that they cook with the butter inside the dumplings. I put the seasoned oysters to freeze for 25 to 30 minutes to solidify them for easier stuffing. Meantime, I am going to prepare the shell stock. Yes, you heard it right. I do not discard the shells, 
I cook them by adding lemon juice or apple cider in the water to extract as much calcium and valuable sea minerals from them as possible. I then filter the water twice or thrice as much as needed to achieve visible cleanness. The dough has matured. Poke and deflate it if needed. Then cut into four even pieces. Divide again to final cuts. I have 22 oyster shells, each turning into three to four in diameter discs. By the way, the cuts do not have to be perfectly round. Another way is to roll and flat the entire dough and cut it with ravioli cutters like this. Press to make the edges thinner than the center of the discs. Then water the edges with clean fingertips. Closing of dumplings requires a training, which I do not have. After placing oysters in the very center, press the edges together in the center and simultaneously with one hand pinch and press the remaining sides in a way that you fold the edges only on one side pushing it toward the opposite side to stick. After, give some curve as well, which not only improves the looks, but makes the dumplings easy to work with on the pan, keeping them upright. Make sure that the folders are on one side and the other side is flat. Place the dumplings on the non-stick preheated and oiled pan on medium heat with closed lid. Fry for 2 to 3 minutes until the bottoms are brown. Then sprinkle with small amount of oyster juice and close to steam. Uncover after 3 minutes and let them fry again for another 5 minutes on medium heat until the juice is gone and the bottoms are golden brown. Now we have dumplings crunchy and crispy on one side and soft and tender on the other. 
Dress the plate with the golden brown side facing up, dressing with your favorite greens. Here I use fresh verdolaga. And eat the dumplings by dipping in the ramekin filled with a mixture of soy sauce and balsamic vinegar. This was quite a journey for the oysters that were picked up in their natural shells and ended up in different shells, battered shells, from one shell to another. This was my very first experience in making this particular recipe that I invented. You can also cook them for 7 minutes in the shell stock turning the meal into a fabulous soup. To which you can add saffron, chopped fresh dill and green onion. Believe me or not, this is what you get if you don't know what you're doing, which is surprisingly similar to what you would get if you did. The point I make is that experience and skills are not enough to achieve perfectly and evenly shaped dumplings, especially when stuffing those with oysters is a challenge. Seafood usually pairs well with white wine. Tired of cliché, I toast with Smirnoff, infused with lemon and lime juice with these mini shots or cordials. Slancha, which in Gaelic means to your health. Your response to my toast will be Slancha Agatsa, which means to your health as well. Scones, that's the first name in the list of Irish desserts, or as they name it, the afters. Today I'm going to bake my modified version, which may not be as cutey as the traditional one, but will be very tasty and comforting, I guess. I am experimenting with this recipe for the first time. I will enrich the scones with grated carrots, white walnuts and dust them with green matcha tea to make them visibly Irish. The dough is made from 2 cups of flour. Here I have a mix of all-purpose flour and coconut flour. Whatever you have, make it 2 cups or 400 grams. Instead of sugar, I use maple syrup and a bit of raw honey. And because I add natural raw honey, I'm not going to use baking powder, which otherwise is required in the standard recipe. I use this truffled acacia honey. I will add 200 grams of diced cold butter. Remember, the butter must be cold, not melted. Then I will add one egg, buttered egg. Yes, buttered egg. The Irish like to butter the eggshells before using. They dip the raw eggs into melted butter and keep for a month or so. And no matter how hard you try to hard boil those eggs, you cannot. No matter how long you boil them, the eggs remain soft boiled, over easy and very tasty. 
The consistency of the dough must not be homogeneous or uniform. Don't overmix the dough. That's the secret for a perfect scone. Now I will add the liquid ingredients. Usually it is buttermilk, but I will add cream. I will add a handful of grated carrots. Because I did not squeeze the carrot juice out, I am reducing the amount of cream accordingly. At this point I will add pre-roasted white walnuts. Working with the Irish scone dough is much fun, as technically there is no work to do. Mix until a shaggy dough forms without kneading. Just boil the dough like this and flat it by hands. No rolling pan is necessary. Then use cookie cutter for various shapes, usually 3 inches or 7 to 8 centimeters in diameter. For egg washing, I'm using this mixture of egg yolk and cream. I egg wash the surfaces and put into the oven for about 40 to 50 minutes, 350 F or 180 Celsius until golden brown. Then dust them with a mix of confetti sugar and matcha green tea for a hint of Ireland. You can try them with gems or marmalades or curds like this. But I will refrain from any addition as my scones already contain walnuts and carrots. It's tea time! If you opt to try something liquidy, which in Irish is measured by pints, which they name pint, make sure you understand that when an Irish invites you for a pint, you are prepared for three pints, not one. As whatever is said in relation to drinking must be tripled in your mind. In dessert section, I presented another piece of my solid silver collection. I bought this basket recently, last October. It is from Chester, England. A 60 gram solid sterling silver Edwardian bonbon basket from Colin Hewer, made in 1907. Let me magnify. Here you see the lion passant for purity mark. Also the town mark for Chester, which is three wet sheaves and a sword. In the catalog website, enter the town mark for Chester, open a page like this. The tabulation starts with the year of 1700, when Chester Essay Office was established by the Act of Parliament. The Chester Office was closed in August of 1962, in case you are interested. 
Now, on this page, click on the date letter G and you will be navigated to another page for the date marks, where you will see the full mark of this basket made in 1907, during the reign of King Edward VII. So today, this basket is 114 years old. I also use the Russian solid silver teacup holder, but stakanik, 875 purity silver, made in 1956 or 58, in the Kubachi style, which is gold plate with black cloisonne enamel. Ta sulagam gurbein tutetnam asmoshio. Slam!